So today we are going to do the cell. Now, as we learned before, or I don't know if you ever learned before, but uh, let's assume that you already know cell. It's the basic unit of life. Without cell, or without a cell, nothing can be considered a living thing. So today we're going to go ahead and we're actually going to see what do we have inside the cell or what the cell is formed of and what makes this cell so special and so interesting. Well, I'm just going to give you just the intro basics of it. I'm not going to get into detail with of any of all the components inside the cell because there is hundreds, maybe thousands of components there, but I'm just going to give you the main basic components of it. But before we learn about cells, let's see how were the cells or when were the cells first time observed. So this guy, Robert Hooke, is the first one that observed a cell in about, that was about 400 years ago. Then this other guy right here, Anthony Van Hooke, he did describe the cells. Now the first cells that he probably could have observed, it can be nothing else, just bacteria. Now, what do you think he observed when he looked at bacteria? Probably when he looked under the microscope, he noticed that the cell, it's moving. Because bacterial cells have some uh, structures outside that might, or that helps them move around. So this is probably whatever he's seen first time. Probably some infection or, or, or I don't know, what, what did he see at that time. Uh, then, these two guys, 1833-1838, they came up with a theory that the actual all living things have to be composed of cells. Otherwise, we, we cannot uh, call them living things. Now, also this other guy right here, Rudolf, came up with a theory that all cells come from other cells, which means what? Basically, you cannot create cells out of nothing, out of thin air. So one cell come from another cell. So if a cell or if an organism, it's made up of at least one cell, then obviously all the other cells come from the, uh, from that original cell. If you think about it, us as human being, we're created from what? You had this sperm, right? Which fused with the egg. The sperm had its nucleus in there with the chromosome. This egg has it. Now, let me put it the other way around. This sperm actually came this way, fused, and we end up with a cell with the way we know it today with 46 chromosome. And from this one cell, look at you, and you end up as a living or a very complex organism just from that one, one cell. So basically, from this slide, what you need, I want you guys to take home, it's that all living things are composed of cells, otherwise they would not be considered living, and cells come from other cells. Any questions so far? I hope not, but here is the cell theory and you have all the three of them that I just stated. Basic unit of life, cells come from pre-existing cells and all living organisms composed of cells. It's kind of redundant now. Now here you can see a cell. This one right here, it's a cell. Now this is a human or a plant cell. Obviously it's a plant cell. Why is it a plant cell? It's green, first of all. If it's green, it contains what? It contains the pigment chlor chlorophyll, which makes it green. Here you see the chloroplast pushed outside. Inside here, this part right here, if you look under the microscope, that is, we're gonna learn uh, today later, it's called the central vacuole, which pushes the chloroplast towards the side. And right here on the outside, you can see the actual cell wall. Now, when all these guys looked at cells, they could not see them with a naked eye because the cells are very, very, very small. So then what did they do? They have to build or they have to make some type of microscope. Now, last Friday, we used a microscope. So a microscope, it's made up of, or, or I'm sorry, it's not made up of anything. It's made up of a lot of parts, but there is two types. There is compound, or I'm sorry, there's light microscope, and then there is the, so there is the light microscope, 
And then there is the electron microscope. I'm gonna write them right here. Electron microscope. Now light microscope, light microscope, it's composed or it's, there's two kinds. There is compound and there is dissecting microscope. Dissecting microscope. Now, what is the difference between them? If you look right here, this one, it's a compound microscope. Let me show you actually how a dissecting microscope looks like. Let me get something fast here, guys. Uh, dissecting microscope. That's how a dissecting microscope looks. So, um, So when you look right here, I'm gonna show you in a second. When you look, when you look right here, you notice this is a dissecting microscope. Now, what is the difference between this microscope and the one that I showed you earlier? The main difference is if you notice right here, right here at the bottom, there is no stage, first of all, and then light comes from here at the bottom and the, the slide actually goes right in it. For the compound microscope that I just showed you earlier, for the compound microscope that I showed you earlier, that I showed you here, compound microscope, light comes from the bottom, passes through it, and the specimen, it's set right there. We're gonna put it right there on the stage. Then these objectives right here, we're gonna align with the slide. Light passes, uh, light passes from the bottom through it. And that way we can collect and we can actually see the information right here by the oculars. So dissecting microscope does not have this stage where the actual slide it is. But rather than that, it's actually the slide, it sits right there on the light. Now also the dissecting microscope has light that comes from somewhere here. Light that comes from somewhere here. Let me show you one more time. Fast. When you look right here, it has light right there. That's where the light is basically. That's where the light comes from. And then there is some light here at the bottom too, but light usually comes from the bottom. Now this type of dissecting microscope or types of dissecting microscope that probably you've seen, it's the uh, operating room, a surgeon has these really long objectives, less light comes from the top so he can see what he's going to cut on the surface. Now usually with dissecting microscope you see only what's on the surface but with a compound microscope you usually see what it's happened or, or um, what is it inside and also the slide that we use has to be very very thin, okay? Any questions so far? I hope not. All right, so let's go next part. Okay, right there, and let's go back to this one. Now here you can see the other type of microscope, which is the electron microscope. Now this one can magnify, look how gigantic it is right here. You're never gonna get close to one of these, but this one can see up to a billion up to a billion times it can magnify. This one here can magnify only up to about a thousand times. Now the one that we use in the lab throughout the semester, most of the time do not magnify uh, objects larger than 400, uh, uh, they do not magnify larger than 420X. So the one that we have in the lab that we use, it's only 420X. This electron microscope actually is up to a billion. Now check out the difference. Light microscope, electron microscope. Obviously, way better details on the electron than the light microscope. Now here you can see a scale of what you can see with the eye. Then you can see with the light microscope and how low the electron microscope go. It goes all the way to the smallest molecule, all the way to proteins, ribosomes, all those ones. You can see them with the electron microscopes. Now, cells, are very small. Now, why cells are very small? This is very, very important. 
the surface area of a cell is important because inside the cell are all the chemical reaction that keep the body or the living organism at a balance, which is called homeostasis. Now, the cell takes stuff from outside, brings it inside and eliminates or expels stuff from inside the cell, outside the cell. Why is that thing needed? If this is your cell, garbage or stuff that is not needed or is stuff that is produced inside the cell and is needed in other, in other parts of the body, it's expelled. Cell also gets a lot of stuff from outside, like what, like glucose, like uh, for energy, like water sometimes, it needs to increase its size. So when it does this one, the surface area of the cell, it's very, very, very important. Now, why is it very important? We always look at the surface area versus the volume, versus the volume. This is the ratio that we're gonna use. Now, the smaller the cell, the higher the surface to volume ratio. And if it's higher, it's way more efficient. Check out here what I mean. This is a large cell. This is the same cell right here. It's actually, I'm sorry, this is not the same cell. This is a large cell. It's two centimeter. And this is a smaller cell. Just one centimeter, just half the size. Now, when you look at the surface area for both of them, you're gonna notice what? That the total surface area of this cell is 24 centimeter. The one, this one right here, with one cent, with the, uh, sorry, with uh, that, uh, that the side is one centimeter. Actually, its surface area should be one times one, no, sorry, not times one, times one, which is one times six sides, so it would be six centimeter square. That would be the area. For this one here, what would it be? Two times two, that's a surface area of a square, so that would be exactly 20, times two times six sides. So there will be 24 centimeters. So for the two centimeter is gonna be 24 centimeters square. For one, it's gonna be six centimeters square, the surface area. Now, the volume, what will be the volume? It's length times width times height. So the volume of this one centimeter would be what? One times one times one, which is one cubic centimeter. If it's two, it's going to be two times two times two, which equal eight cubic centimeters. So now when you do the math right here, what do you notice? If you do the math here, this one is going to give you three. This one is going to give us six. So which one has a higher surface to volume ratio? Definitely the cell that has a smaller um, side or it's smaller itself. So that's why it's very important to have a higher surface to volume ratio because all this stuff has to come out. Now, the more stuff that happens inside, the more surface area we need. The, for example, if you work in a building, if you work in a house and you have a lot of activities happening in there, let's assume the whole uh, uh, business, it's in that house. To get everything out of there, it takes very long time. But if I have the same business in a three-story building, which way do you think it's much easier to just get it out? Because it has many more doors, it's much easier to get it from a, on a building that has the smaller, uh, um, the, 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 the higher the surface, the volume, higher the surface area to the volume would be much, much easier to get it out. So anytime you see a small, cell or a small object versus its volume or the inside part which is the volume the ratio always it's going to be higher now cells are divided into two kinds prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells prokaryotic cells are bacteria and we learned in the first lecture there is archaea and regular bacteria eukaryotic cells are all the other cells which actually have one interesting feature. They contain a nucleus which contains DNA. Now for, prokary for prokaryotic cells, DNA, it's just inside, but there is no nucleus. 
there is no enclosed membrane where the DNA is going to be stored. There is no such thing. Now, features of both cells, both of the cells, prokaryotic, let's say eukaryotic, prokaryotic, eukaryotic cells have plasma membrane. Both of the cells have plasma membrane. Also, the inside part here, it's called cytoplasm. This jelly-like fluid, it's called cytoplasm. Now, for prokaryotes, DNA is just going to be found in a region inside the cell. For eukaryotes, actually, there is another cell membrane there. It's another plasma membrane. It's another type of membrane, which we call nuclear membrane. And inside this nuclear membrane, that's where DNA is stored. Now, why do eukaryotes have this nuclear membrane? Uh, eukaryotes have the nuclear membrane because the actual cells are much more complex. The actual organism is much more complex. So then you need what? You need to protect the DNA because the DNA is the blueprint that makes up the cells. Uh, sorry, not the cells, the body. DNA, it's the blueprint that makes the body the way it looks like. If there is damage or the DNA gets damaged, what's going to happen? Then the whole actual body will be or suffer mutations or changes. And we don't want that. So as I mentioned earlier, a, a cell is made up of plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and nucleus. These are the three main parts. Now, do prokaryotes have nucleus? Prokaryotes do not have nucleus. Okay, so let's go quickly to see the main parts of a pre prokaryotic cell. Nucleoid is the part where the actual DNA is found. So rather than the nucleus, where it's going to be stored for eukaryotes, the region where nucleus is, uh, the, where DNA is going to be found, it's called nucleoid. Also, prokaryotic cells have the cell membrane, which is the outside part of the, the outside part of the cell. Now, the cell membrane, it's a lipid bilayer. Bi means two, so it's made up of two fatty layer. Lipid bilayer, two fatty layer. Inside, these cells have ribosomes, which have one important function in eukaryotic and prokaryotic cell. Synthesize protein. Also, prokaryotic cells, I didn't put it here, but they have mitochondria. Now, mitochondria it's this organelle or this part inside the cell that is involved in energy production. And we're going to learn, learn by the end of today how it looks like. Now, outside the cell membrane, this bacteria needs to have even more uh, help. Why? Because they're exposed to all kinds of conditions. So if they're exposed to all kinds of conditions, the cell membrane can easily disintegrate. So if it disintegrates, it's going to kill the bacteria. So through evolution, they evolved a couple other things in top of the cell membrane. First of all, it's the cell wall, which help with maintaining the shape of the cell. And the capsule, it's the outside, most outside part, which is a protective layer of polysaccharides. So we have cell membrane that surrounds the cell. This is the cell membrane. Outside the cell membrane, you have the cell wall. And outside the cell wall, there is another layer, which is the capsule. So there is three layers outside for the prokaryotic cells. This one is the lipid bilayer that protects the, um, or, or uh, encapsulates the cytoplasm. The next one, it helps with the shape. And the last one, it's a protective role. Cell wall is found not only in plants, as I mentioned earlier, and bacteria, but it's also found in fungi. And you could see here the three types of sugars that make up the cell wall of plants, fungi, and bacteria. Cellulose, plants, chitin, fungi, and peptidoglycan in bacteria. Eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are more complex. They have more um, activities or more chemical reaction that takes place inside. Now, these eukaryotic cells depend upon some structures and organelles inside to take care of all the functions that it needs. 
This function can be classified in four categories. First, manufacture. Sometimes you need to break down molecules. Energy processing. And then organelles or structure that are involved in support, movement, and communication. Now, for manufacturing, when the organelles in, they are found in the nucleus, uh, sorry, in the nucleus, in the cell are called nucleus, ribosome, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus. And we're gonna go over each one of them. So this one, two, three, four are involved in manufacturing. Break down, lysosome, vacuoles, peroxyzine. We're gonna go over a few of them in a minute. Energy processing, basically it produces energy and then you have two main organs, mitochondria and chloroplast. Mitochondria in animal and plants and chloroplast only in plants. So chloroplast, you're not gonna find them in any animal cell. Structural support, movement and communication. Now, which ones are those? Basically, these ones involve the cytoskeleton, the plasma membrane, and the cell wall, which are the parts outside. At the end of the day, I will recommend for you to guys watch this uh, video. It's a short video, which is called Life Inside the Cell. Now, watching that, you're going to notice there the cytoskeleton, the plasma membrane, the cell wall, all the other organelles, the nucleus, the DNA, everything. It's a really cool video produced by the... Uh, I think the Harvard students. Now let's go quickly before we start and we get into the dive inside the cell. Let's see what is the main difference between an animal cell versus a plant cell. Now for animal cells, lysosome and centrioles are not found in the plant cell. You just find them only in the animal cells. Plant cells have a rigid cell wall, chloroplast, and a central vacuole that's never going to be found in the animal cells. So animal cells do not have cell wall. Neither, they don't have a central vacuole. In, in a minute, I'll show you. Central vacuole. Now, what I recommend while you guys go over these um, uh, 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 slides, try to look on Google and type up what a cell wall looks like, what chloroplasts look like, what central vacuole, and just get an idea of how they look like. Also, how lysosome look like. Go to Google, type lysosome, look on the images there, and you can find a lot of them, how they look like, centrioles also. So you can have an idea when the exam, time the exam comes. Here you can see a plant cell, uh, sorry, a plant cell, an animal cell, oh, wow, animal cell here. Here you can see a plant cell. How do I know this is a plant cell? Because right here in the middle, I have the central vacuole. I have a bunch of these chloroplasts right here. And I have the cell wall, which is so thick right there. You could see it, the cell wall. Now, when you look at this one, then you don't see any uh, cell wall and you don't see any uh, chloroplasts. But here you're going to see what? The centrioles, these are the region, and we're going to learn later during meiosis and mitosis, they actually form the spindle fibers and the lysosome. And we're going to see in a minute what the function of lysosome is. Hopefully, you have no question. Now, let's dive and see actually, or we'll, let's take all the organelles or most of the important organelles that make up the cell. One of the organelles, or the first one which is found outside the cell, it's called plasma membrane or cell membrane. Now, plasma membrane, as I mentioned earlier, it's a lipid bilayer. So when you guys study, please try to use your own notes. Try to take this, not, uh, uh, not just read and try to memorize. Try to take these notes while you read so you can visualize this thing. That's what science is. Science is more visualiz visualization. So, Plasma membrane, it's a lipid bilayer. Now, when you look at this part right here, you see right here, this is one layer, this is a second layer. And if you look here, look how beautifully they are arranged. This, all of them here. At the bottom, the same way. Now, why they are arranged like this? Because since it's a lipid bilayer, it means that it has two layers. Sorry, it's like there, two layers. Now, Always the fat is going to be inside or the lipid. They expose inside next to each other. They are basically fats attract fats. The outside part right here and at the bottom, it's the hydrophilic part. 
hydrophilic part, hydrophilic part, hydrophilic, philia water. We learned this one, uh, I think in a, a couple of lectures ago. So hydrophilic means that it loves water. Now during the organic molecules, we'll learn about the phospholipids. Now this plasma membrane, it's made up of phospholipids or it's a phospholipid bilayer. Now a phospholipid, I don't know if you guys remember, it looks something like this and he had two tails. Now, this at the bottom, there is another head right there and there's another two tails. So this would be really tight and that's how they, the lipid bilayer looks like. Now, this is the fat part. This is the hydrophilic part. This is the phosphate, phosphate part, which is the hydrophilic part. Now, if you notice right here on the cells, Towards the outside, there is this little head sticking out. Now, these little heads are actual proteins. So basically, in the plasma membrane, you have a bunch of proteins embedded. By embedded means what? They are just encapsulated or just really stuck inside the cell membrane. Also right here, you have this little hair-like structure sticking out from the protein. Now this one it's called a glycoprotein because it's made up of a carbohydrate, the glycopart, and then the protein. Now this glycoprotein, this little hair like structures right there, they are involved in cell signaling. Cell signaling. What is cell signaling? As the name itself implies, cell signaling basically allows the cell to communicate with each other. Remember, we are made up of gazillion, bazillion of cells. I don't know, millions and millions and millions and millions of bazillions of cells. Now, all these cells have to communicate with each other. If they don't communicate, then the body will break down and probably we're gonna die or we're gonna be affected. We're gonna end up with some type of diseases when they cannot communicate. Cells throughout the body get messages and they have to make certain things. Nucleus, it's inside. Nucleus, as I mentioned earlier, also has an, a membrane right there, which is called nuclear membrane. Now, inside the nucleus, you have the DNA and some proteins in there, which are called histones. So all those ones are found inside the nucleus. Now, that nucleus or that DNA with those proteins, it's protected by the cell, not the cell, sorry, the nuclear membrane. It's protected by the nuclear membrane. Now, nuclear membrane, when you look like here, it's also a lipid bilayer. It's lipid bilayer right there. You see right here how they fold? One, two lipid bilayers there. That's what they have. So it's a lipid bilayer because it's folding. Now, inside here, what do we have? We have this structure which is called nuclear pore. Now, what is the function of this nuclear pore? Since the nucleus doesn't require or doesn't have in the membrane, doesn't have these proteins or doesn't need to communicate with anything outside. And there's not too many things produced inside the nucleus. There's only messenger RNA, which is basically transcribed from the DNA, has to come out. So when it comes out, it doesn't need anything else. All what it needs, it's just these little pores or these little holes which will allow for the RNA to come out. I hope it makes sense by now that it starts connecting the dots. So, so far we learned what? The outside, which is the cell membrane, and then inside there's this small structure which is called the nuclear membrane which makes up the nucleus which basically stores the DNA for protection. Here you can see a picture. Here you can see how the nucleus looks like. And you can see also what is very interesting right here. You can see how the actual nuclear membrane extends outside and it forms these little small channels right here. They are connected together all the way to the outside to the cell membrane. Now we're gonna learn next. These ones right here are called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now the region inside there, 
where DNA, most of the DNA is found, it's called the nucleolus. That's where the actual ribosomes are produced. That's where the actual ribosomes are produced. Oh, I put right here at the bottom. Nucleolus produces ribosomal RNA, which eventually ends up as the ribosomes. Ribosomes. When I went over the organelles found in the bacteria, ribosome were there and they are found actually in the bacteria too. Why? Because ribosomes have one very, very extremely important function. It's to synthesize proteins. Our body requires a lot of proteins. We're made up of proteins. So we constantly need to synthesize this protein. And we synthesize them in very, very large amounts. Now these ribosomes could be free or they can be bound. So when you look at this cell right here, oops, let me see where was the cell. Oops, see, was it right here? Yes, you could see right here. You see these little things just free right there, right there around. And then you can see this one attached right here to this blue part. Now the cell, each cell is made out of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of this ribosome. Why? Because each ribosome will produce a small, tiny microscopic protein. And remember, proteins are very, very small. So to make a protein, you require hundreds of thousands of these ribosomes. Now, why there is two ribosomes? Now, ribosome can be attached, as in the case right here, or ribosomes are actually uh, free uh, um, around the cell. Because the free one, they, both of them actually, and uh, uh, synthesize protein. So both of them are important because they synthesize protein. Now the difference is that the bound one actually require that some of those proteins to be rearranged or to be folded. Remember when we talked about the uh, proteins structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, this ribosome produce them in the primary structure. Now from the primary structure, these proteins have to be rearranged to take the, the, the three-dimensional, the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary structure. If they are free in the cell, just floating around, they're much easier to be uh, uh, expelled or taken outside the cell. They are produced immediately and shipped outside the cell without being, um, without being uh, 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 changed. And they will be actually rearranged in the uh, functional structure we're at the destination site. And now here you can see how the ribosomes look like. You have them attached on the electron microscope. Here they are attached and a bunch of them are just floating around. Now the attached one are attached actually to ER or endoplasmic reticulum. The one attached here, they are called uh, ribosomes attached to the ER are called rough ER or rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now we also have smooth ER. Endoplasmic reticulum can be smooth also where there is no ribosome. So by now you kind of have an idea of the function of the, of the um, endoplasmic reticulum. If it has these ribosomes attached to it, what function do you think will have? Give you a second to think about it. What function do you think this rough ER will have? It's basically what it has a function to basically take in the actual protein that it's produced in the ribosomes. When a protein it's produced right here, it just takes it in and then it forms these vesicles which break off the endoplasmic reticulum and are taken to the next organelle, which I'm going to talk in a second, which will, which it's involved in actual rearranging it into the functional form or the functional structure, the protein. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum, since it doesn't have ribosomes attached to it, definitely cannot be involved in protein synthesis or protein production. So smooth ER, actually it's involved in poison detoxification and lipid synthesis. Now, can you, any of you think about it? Where inside the cell you would have a lot of, or I'm sorry, where inside the body or which organ in the body would contain or would have a lot of this smooth ER? Let me give you like five seconds or so or 10 seconds. Think about it.
Now, if you guys thought about liver, you are definitely correct because remember, liver, it's involved in body detoxification. So remember, smooth yarn involved in detoxification and making lipids. Where will you have making lipids? In the fatty cells around our body, in the adipocytes or the cells that make actually, or they store the fat. Rough yarn in protein production because it has the ribosomes attached to it. Here you could see the uh, uh, electron, electron microscope picture of rough ER versus smooth ER. So remember, ribosomes synthesize protein. Once the protein is synthesized inside the endoplasmic reticulum, endoplasmic reticulum will start breaking into a vesicle, into a vesicle, and then this vesicle will flow to the uh, next site, which is the Golgi apparatus. Now, what is the function of the Golgi? Golgi is basically are just like a bunch of flattened sacs that, involved, that are involved in modifying, packaging, storing, and then in eventually transport the materials outside the cells. Now, if you notice here, works with the ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum. So basically, these, ves these vesicles, they come from endoplasmic reticulum. You see right here, this vesicle that comes from endoplasmic reticulum comes to the Golgi. It's going to fuse with the Golgi. Proteins are dumped or, or, or uh, um, released in the Golgi, the flattened sacs, where they're going to be rearranged. So look how they enter and look eventually how they exit on the other side or what they, they're gonna end up as. Now, as soon as the protein is rearranged, it's going to be released into a vesicles, the same type of vesicles right here that was for ER. And then this vesicle will either go out inside the cell or will go inside and do its job. Now here you see one of these vesicles that turns or it's called a lysosome. Why this vesicle is called lysosome? It's called lysosome because these proteins inside, these proteins inside actually are involved in digestion. Digestion. Digestion means breaking down. In the breakdown of molecules, stuff that it's not needed around the cell. An example we have right here. This is the lysosome, basically, which is the Golgi membrane right there with the protein that's rearranged inside. Now, this protein is going to go, this, this go, lysosome will go and it's going to fuse with a vacuole or a vesicles that contain a bad mitochondria, mitochondria that is dead, that is not needed anymore. So then what do you do? These two fuse together, then these enzymes, these digestive enzymes inside will start chopping and breaking down this mitochondria and then this is what is going to happen or that's what is left from that mitochondria. Now, if we go back here, what you're going to notice, this basically lysosome, what is it going to do, this vesicle? Will eventually fuse, kind of like this one right here, will fuse with the membrane and then it's going to dump its content, content out. Now, this membrane or this vesicle that fuses with the membrane and dumps it whole contents, the contents in the whole outside the cell, in the blood, they are called exocytotic because they go outside the cytoplasm, exo, outside cytoplasm, cytocytoplasm, exocytoplasm, outside the cytoplasm. This cell uh, or this part right here, this vesicle that fuses or it forms right here and it breaks off the, the cell membrane and then it goes inside the cell, it's called an endocytotic, cytotic. Endo versus exocytotic. This is exo, this is endo, endo comes inside. So there is endocytotic and exocytotic vesicles. These are the vesicles that I talked about earlier. 
Now lysosomes were one of example of the vesicles. Now, membrane sacs also, they can have other function inside the body. One of them is the central vacuole, which is very, very, very important. Why? Because it's found only and only in plants and it has hydrolytic function. Basically, it's kind of like us. It contains those, um, what do you call those magnesium, uh, those ions, which are required, electrolytes, contains electrolytes, which will allow the water from the leaf to go out or come inside, absorb more water or release more water. Pigment vacuoles. Pigment vacuoles, as the name tells you, store those chemicals which give the color to the plants, which give the pigment. So basically this pigment you're gonna find in all flowers which have different colors. Con contractile vacuole or contractile vacuoles. Now, as the name tells you, contractile, contract, it means it contracts. Now these vacuoles, they have one interesting ability. They have the ability to contract and relax, contract and relax, contract and relax. Now, if it's a vacuole or it looks like a vesicle inside, imagine that you have a balloon, a balloon that it's filled up with water and it has only that, that small exit, that, that small through which you blow to, to blow the balloon, to inflate it. Now, the question is, when you squeeze that balloon, what's going to happen? That's called contraction. Water will be expelled. When the balloon will relax, what's gonna happen? We'll take in water, we'll suck in water basically, or water is going to move inside. Now the same thing, these vacuoles work like, and they're found usually in some proteins which are single cell organisms. Single cell organisms in water. If these organisms live their whole life in water or they're found in water, they have to find a way in their single cell. Remember, they're single cell. If they are single cell, water constantly moves in. If water constantly moves in, these cells will eventually explode if they would not be able to expel some of the water outside. So they have this vacuole which have the ability actually to expel water. They work like pumps. When the cell has too much water, it contracts and it expels water. Then that pump fills up, and then as soon as it's filled up, contracts, and then they will expel the water outside. So the three main vacuoles are the central vacuoles found in plants and only in plants involved in hydrolytic function. Basically, when the plants wilt, you know, the plants look uh, winter, spring, when there's plenty of water, they look very rigid, very stiff. In the summer, but it's, when it's very hot, like those days, this uh, couple of weeks ago we had, when it was 120 degrees Celsius, then what's gonna happen? Plants do not get enough water, and then because of evaporation, and then they start wilting. Now, why do they wilt? Because of this central vacuole loses a lot of the water and does not allow the leaf to, to maintain its rigid, rigidity. Pigment are the one that are in, found in anything that it's colored, like flowers, any flowers. And then contractile vacuoles are the one found in single cell involved in water expelling or when water is expelled. Now to get a quick review, the main organelles that I taught you so far, nucleus, which store the DNA. And remember, nucleus has this little zit-like structure. They look like zits there, but they are actually called pores. What comes out of it? Just the messenger RNA and the um, ribosomal RNA. As they come out from here, they're gonna go and they're gonna look for this structure, which are called ribosomes. Remember, ribosomes can be attached or they can be free. There is no free ribosome, but I'm just gonna put these dots right here. Let's assume that these are the the free ribosome. Now, this free ribosome, do they have a different function than the attached one to the endoplasmic reticulum? No, they have exactly the same function to synthesize protein. Then we have the endoplasmic reticulum, which is basically a continuous membrane from the nucleus. And this endoplasmic reticulum function is to 
do what? If it's a RAF, it's to help in synthesis and of protein and transport of protein. You see how they break off right there after the protein is produced and it's taken to the Golgi apparatus. Or if they are free, like this one right here, uh, sorry, free, like they're uh, smooth, like this one right here, like these parts right here or like right here, or right here, they are involved in lipid synthesis and detoxification. Then the Golgi, which is involved in rearranging, rearranging of the protein and make them functional state. And then the lysosomes are the digestive vacuoles inside the, the cell. Now remember, these vacuoles could be endo or exocytotic. Endo goes in, exo goes out. Now, the last two structures that we're going to learn today are mitochondria, mitochondria, and chloroplast. Now, both of them are involved in production of energy. Mitochondria involved in cellular respiration. And basically, what it does, it looks like this, and it breaks down glucose. It produces a TP, that's what we call. This is the energy or the fuel for the cell. A cell cannot work or cannot do anything unless it has its fuel, which is ATP. All the, and all the functions inside the cell are run by ATP. Like a car needs gas, diesel, whatever it runs on. The same thing, mitochondria produces the ATP, which is required for the cell. So basically this mitochondria is like a gas pump. That would be a good analogy. Now, it's interesting enough, mitochondria has some DNA, which is called mitochondrial DNA. Now this is very, very, very old DNA. Uh, does it have any main functions inside the cell? Uh, we don't know about it, but we assume that uh, mitochondria used to be an old cell and eventually end up stuck inside the main cell and lost its function, but it kept its DNA. Just eventually, maybe a billion years from now, it's going to break off from the cell and then it's going to become a, a cell of its own. But so far, the only function that it has inside the cell, it's involved in cellular respiration to produce chemical energy, which is called the ATP. Now, if you look here, this mitochondria, it's made up of two membranes, the outer and the inner membrane. Now, when you look here, you see this inner membrane has these foldings or indentation, we call them. You see how many foldings it has right here? Any of you have any idea why those foldings are there? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. Now, if you thought about the fact that increased surface area, you are correct. That's the right answer. You basically, or the cell or the mitochondria increases its surface area. And we're going to learn later when we do cellular respiration, why it's important to have increased surface area. Now inside you see there is a bunch of this water or liquid like inside. It looks a little bit jelly-ish kind of. Now the liquid inside, it's called matrix, matrix, and it contains all, it contains all the enzymes and every, all the chemicals required for production of ATP or involved in production of ATP. Here you can see a mitochondria under the electron microscope right there. Chloroplast is the next organelle. And this chloroplast, it's also involved in energy production. Now this one, it's a little bit different and uses different things. This one, it's involved basically in photosynthesis. Photo means light, synthesize. Basically, it takes the light and it turns it into energy. So chloroplasts, what they do, they turn the light into energy, chemical energy through the process called photosynthesis. Now, basically takes the light and turns it into sugar. That's what chloroplast does. Picks up light and turns it into sugar. Now, have you heard of any animal that can just sit outside in the sun and doesn't have to ever eat? And then it has all the energy that it needs? I've never heard of one. 
but have you heard that plants, have you seen a plant just, have you gone and did you ever feed a plant? Did you give her breakfast, lunch or dinner? I'm assuming not, because if you do that, there must not be a plant. It must be some type of organism or animal at that time, at that point. So plants have the capability to use light and turn it into sugar, which is chemical energy. Now check out here how chloroplast looks like. Chloroplast looks like a dome right there. Also has an outer and arena membrane, but those are not very important in the case of chloroplast, only in the case of um, mitochondria. It's very important, the inner membrane. In the case of chloroplast, it's not. What is important for chloroplast, you see these little structures inside. Now this little structure looks like coins right there, like quarters. When you go do the laundry, you know, and you go outside your house and you use on the laundromat, you use those packs of quarters, right? Now, these quarters right there are called, each one individual, it's called thylakoid. So each one of this one, it's called thylakoid. Together, this whole stack, it's called granum or grana. Plural, it's grana when there is many. Now you have the thylakoid, you have the granum and the grana or grana. Now these thylakoids or granum or granas are found actually in a fluid similar to the fluid that we see right here for mitochondria. Now this fluid, it's called stroma. Stroma also contains all the chemicals and all the enzymes required, required by the chloroplast to produce the chemical energy. So now, since we finish with the chloroplast, let's go back here and review the four main structure or the four main functions that the cell uh, has. Manufacture, by now you should be able to tell me at least one organelle which is able to manufacture inside the cell. You should be able to tell me one organelle which involved in breakdown of molecules. You should be able to also tell me some that is involved in two of them. Actually, they are involved in energy processing. Now, for structure, support, movement, and communication, I did not talk too much about that. But for communication, I mentioned one there. I don't know if you guys remember when we talked about the glycoproteins that is found on the surface of the, of the pro, proteins that are embedded inside the plasma membrane. Now, we're gonna talk about these ones maybe later or maybe not. Movement, when we, if we were in the lab, we would look probably at um, euglena or we would look at a paramecium. This paramecium right here, that I showed you guys at the beginning, has these hair-like structures. I don't know if you guys can see them. Right here on the surface, there is this hair-like structure. Now, those hair-like structures are called cilia. You see them, you can see them actually even better right here. Cilia, basically, it's involved in, in it's, they look like rowers. So they, what they do, it's involved in the actual movement. Now, what would be an example of structural support? inside the cell, you would have um, these proteins or these tubules, which actually cross the whole cell, cross the whole cell. And that's what they are there for the support and to show how the uh, vesicles have to flow towards outside. Basically inside the cell, the, uh, the life inside the cell looks like literally like a city. To get from one point to another, you're not gonna just flow, flow like a zombie and hopefully I can end up at the point where I'm supposed to be. There's little freeways, highways, streets. They're not like the one that we have, but they kind of look similar to that, the idea of it. So don't forget, let me actually put it right here. What I want you guys to do, I want you guys to go and I want you guys to look for, let me stop sharing this one and let's, Look for the one right here. Let me share with you. And what I want you guys to do, I want you guys to go and look for 
life, oops, life inside the sun. Now, I want you guys to watch this video. It's only about a three minutes video. Now, if you want the explanation and all that, you can go to life right here, BioVisions, Harvard. And what you guys can do, actually, they show you different videos of all these ones that I talk about. All media, you go right here and you can see all of them. And actually, they explain it. This is three minute music version. Then there's another one, the animation that explains uh, what happens. And it's very interesting. And I would like you guys to look at it so you can have an idea. And uh, we're going to talk about it more in the, in the lab. So I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. And I'll see you later.